Welcome to Online Offscript, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Mira McNitt, the social media director at Online Optimism, and this week I have someone new joining me. Hey, I'm Juan Pablo Madrid. I'm Senior Director of Design Innovation at Online Optimism. This week, we're talking about the impact of design and a technology-focused mindset in sectors in need of innovation. Our guest today is Ashley Axios, speaker, strategic creative, and an advocate for design's ability to break barriers and create positive social change. She is Chief Experience Officer and owner of Coforma, a digital consultancy and design firm that crafts creative solutions and builds technology products that support communities. She's also the chair of the board for AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. Prior to her current roles, Axios formed and led the in-house creative agency at Automatic, served as the creative director and digital strategist in the Obama White House, served as president of AIGA Washington, D.C., and more. Thank you so much for joining us, Ashley. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for uh, taking some time to join us. Um, so as I just mentioned in your introduction, uh, you are in charge of design at uh, the White House under the Obama administration, building everything from whitehouse.gov to the We the People uh, petition flap platform. Can't say I didn't send some petitions when I was uh, up there. Um, and part of the uh, first office of digital strategy, if I'm correct. Uh, so. Right. Honestly, I would call that a dream job. Um, when you joined, what was your vision for design and a digital focused government at that point? And how has that vision changed over time? Yeah, you know, and um, it's certainly one of the most incredible roles um, that I think a person could have. I was really honored to be in that position. But I think before I worked in the White House, my perception of what design and government was and could be was was a really low bar, right? Like yeah. <laughs> I wasn't thinking creativity. I wasn't thinking there was innovation. I was thinking there was red tape, bureaucracy, that there would probably be this, you know, uh, focus on, um, you know, politics in the worst kind of way, not politics and governance and politics yeah. and communications and and um, serving constituents and all of that good thing, those good things, transparency, things that we really lived as the Office of Digital Strategy. But I had that perception, I think, from the outside before going in of just kind of um, really the negatives that came with government. And I was surprised to find this opportunity, I think in particular, especially at that time in the Office of Digital Strategy, that it was like this startup in the heart of the White House. So there really was a chance to set a different precedent, to push the envelope, to um, exemplify what you know design systems could look like inside of government and not just kind of somebody did the branding for the agency, yeah. <laughs> which there was some good work on, you know, early, uh, uh, kind of earlier on in the, the 20th century, but really what does it look like in a digital UX context? What does design research look like in these contexts? So a lot of it was really exploratory. We're having, you know, still a little bit of bureaucracy, right? I'm, I can't say that like all that went out the window, but we're yeah. <laughs> able to really <laughs> engage in mm -hmm. um, discussions about like setting policy for social media accounts that aligned with the values and our intent, digging in really deep, figuring out what design systems look like from a digital vantage point for the website, um, what the standards were for access. So, you know, that, that was a large part of what was being built there and has since become like, you know, just the foundational building blocks for a lot of what um, I think we're now working on, not to say it was, all, <laughs> this was my work, but, you know, that that effort um, that was still just budding that time in the government became, I think, a lot of the kind of building blocks that we're still um, uh, kind of contributing to and doing work within the civic space and uh, with the U.S. federal government in particular. I think it's so interesting how you joined basically the first administration that had um, that connection to people via like uh, Obama, I think was the first president to like tweet ever. Not that that got uh, great <laughs> over time, but um, <laughs> uh, certainly like the first administration to really connect with people in such a personal level, like where they were at. Yeah. Whereas before I like, I think my perception of the U S government was this black hole that no one could tap into. Yeah. All the control, but not necessarily like ceding that power. Are you working in my best interest? Who knows? You know, once you get the office, um, kind of unclear. But 
Yeah, I really did try to break that down, break down the walls. There was a really concerted effort to take what made the Obama campaign work so well and that like digital transparency, that engagement directly with constituents, you know, working to meet people where they were on platforms and community and with the types of content and plain language and clear design, um, kind of meeting people where they were that worked so well for the campaign that there was a really concerted effort to make sure that that was also integrated into the Obama White House to make it kind of distinct from prior White Houses. And I think as we've also experienced, unfortunately, like yeah. uh, as much as we tried to pass things on, also pretty distinct from the subsequent uh, kind of administration that um, that kind of followed us. So, you know, there was a lot of like making things align with the with law <laughs> yeah. and the responsibility and the mandate that we had, but also looking at bringing in that intent for the, the individual who was elected into office and integrating that really thoughtfully into how we operated so that those values could fully come through. So, I mean, that was fun to play with and to be able to establish. Um, and, you know, you alluded to, I feel like we've learned a ton from that where mm -hmm. we could have imagined some kind of worst case scenarios. Um, we ended up getting hit with <laughs> with some of those scenarios and like faster than we thought was possible when we had to make the dystopian decisions. view of that. Yeah. 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 You know, um, less on the kind of design side of things, but in the office of digital strategy, our social media team was having in-depth conversations about, okay, we created these social accounts, but what do we do? What is our policy for, you know, whether these get passed on or do they mm -hmm. just get archived? Do people keep the followers? We've got to write this in a way where we don't know what's going to come um, after this time and be as thoughtful uh, as we can about it, try to decide what's right and draw that line in the sand. And then, ooh, was, you know, feeling a little personally, a little bit of like re regret questioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, bet some of those choices later, like, oh, that, that person's got a platform they, they didn't totally um, earn and is doing a lot of uh, damage. But um, we've also seen just how much of that is from like personal accounts um, in yeah. addition to those. That uh, peaceful those transfer of accounts. power of social media accounts wasn't as peaceful, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little bit tense. I'm glad I left, you know, I wasn't like directly the one to hand over anything that would have been, um, it would have been tough for me uh, specifically. So you touched a little bit about how you expected like all this red tape and it wasn't necessarily as restrictive as you thought it was going to be. But what was like very, like the most surprisingly different thing from like working in government and political design versus previous roles? I think, um, it took me a while to learn this lesson, but something I, I feel like has been profound for me since was I never worked in partnership with like lawyers and legal and um, and, and those kind of portions of a, a business in prior roles. It was like, okay, some things would need approval. And that was just kind of something that you'd have to go through that was separate. We really learned in the Obama White House to engage deeply that a lot of the stuff that we're doing was was effectively trying to make or or change um policy so understanding uh why you know ethics team would push back on something and going okay here's what we're trying to achieve how can we do these things let's come up with some new ideas together and and solve things it's like Total, totally new to me. And it really flipped that dynamic on its head too, of like, oh, they're just gonna shoot down, you know, all the creative things we wanted to do because instead, and I think this is really at the heart of a lot of those ideas like co-design, human-centered design kind of practices too. Instead, we were able to really work together to come up with solutions and make sure that they were gonna be compliant and truly thoughtful and not create precedents that we didn't want to <laughs> have out there in the future and just make the most ethical um, solutions possible. And, you know, that is a huge shift from what I had before. And at first was like feeling like a blocker, but it's something I felt like we were really able to turn on its head through deeper engagement and really thinking about the value of the things that at first felt like they were just 
slowing the process down or um, or kind of blockers to getting the work done. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but that's something that comes to mind immediately as a big one for me. Yeah. Did you find that having to like navigate all these different like ethical and future thinking um, boundaries, I would guess I would say, did you find that that really pushed your creativity and made you become a better innovator? Absolutely. Like I, I think not enough designers, not enough people in general really think through the long-term ramifications of the decisions they're making today. And we see that with climate change, socioeconomic <laughs> yeah. impact. Yes. We, I feel like we are kind of seeing the effects of that across the board right now. Um, and really, I think it's a responsibility of designers and a real a gift of um, creative industry to be able to see things realistically today, um, to really understand those problems and think you know, optimistically about the future. But that doesn't mean pretending everything's going to be rainbows and sunshine. We also need to be thinking through the ways that things can fail, the possible implications for communities that might not have been front of mind for us, or um, the ways that others might kind of take the gains that we're making and um, use the use that progress for kind of other aims, even if that's not the intent of the thing that we're creating um, or the precedent that we're set, we're, we're setting, just kind of knowing the ways that those things could be reinterpreted or used for ill harm over time. Those are skills that I think fundamentally we all need to build as creatives over time. And as just thoughtful members of a highly connected society and globe where, um, so many of our decisions are impacting the environments and communities around us and communities and environments that we might not be embedded and thinking of and just kind of recognizing that we come with our own biases and you know initial frameworks that need that challenging so i think it's been uh, really crucial and they're they're fundamental skills that i wish we had like a boot camp to, yeah. <laughs> to, to help folks kind of get a little bit stronger at I've definitely been thinking a lot lately about the the moral responsibilities of people in the just the whole digital sphere, especially when it comes to marketing of just because we can doesn't mean we should. And especially as the like I do social media. So like we have the passwords like uh, as designers, like you have the code, like should we build these things? Should we enter these spaces just because the consumer is there? Does that mean that we need to be? putting ad dollars into it or something like that. And actually, I'm going to jump to a different question because I think it goes in tandem with what we're talking about. Um, Because we watched several of your talks and one of my favorites, one one of my favorite ones was where you discussed um, how selfish design can save the world in a manner of speaking. Basically, when you do good, it feels good. Um, But you warn about not being the right type of selfish sometimes and about designers thinking so much about the effing internet of things um, and um, just how design and technology can drive negativity and misinformation or even contribute to the climate crisis, as you mentioned, um, for, I guess, if you have seen either Mirror of, or my Twitter accounts, we have lots of thoughts on NFTs and cryptocurrency and just how <laughs> that is driving like the climate crisis in a way that many people don't think about. So, um, how do you think we can push emerging designers, technologists, creators to use their gifts selfishly, but for, for the good of other people? Yeah, it's tricky. I think, um, you know, with so much creativity and energy, it'd be really tempting to look at like the latest tech, the newest thing and try to create the newest and latest thing, right? There, we have a little bit of that like shiny, fam- <laughs> shiny thing yeah. tendency to want to create something that's brand new and newness is always um, gonna be appealing, at least the way our culture is right now. And I think a lot of what we have to do is, you know, move against that instinct, like things that are the newest need the most amount of testing validation. We know the least about the long-term impacts, you know, like we're just talking about. Um, It needs a lot of challenging to make sure that it's done well and thoughtfully. I think some of the most meaningful solutions that we can generate right now. And this has definitely surprised me throughout my career, Um, Mm -hmm. but are not the, like the newest tech, like what, 
what we need to better serve folks who are trying to immigrate, who are looking for quality health care, who are, um, you know, themselves um, like coming back from combat and trying to reintegrate into U.S. society, some areas that, that we're thinking about on a regular basis and co-forma. When we're working on those, those types of challenges, the types of solutions that are needed are not blockchain, VR types of solutions. Those are, you know, really paired back simple service design, <laughs> simple tech. And that might not sound sexy to folks, um, but those are the types of um, technologies that are highly tested that are gonna make a difference. We're really focusing on the impact on people, the impact on the uh, environment, communities. If we're looking at um, that as a primary focus and then using the, using the tools kind of secondarily, you know, people process technology. We're not starting with the technology. I think we'll be a better position to make a, a really positive change, uh, to make scalable change and to make change that's not going to create new issues down the road. Um, but a part of that too is just, you know, I think we often, what I talk about a little bit in that talk is we think about things that we can do that are going to solve a problem that we have. And that's natural. It's our own biases. Yeah. <laughs> like I could really use a tool that does this. Like, sure, somebody's made all these headphone stands, but I kind of want one that has like this, <laughs> you know, specific look and feel. And so we solve these sometimes small challenges that are around us and we can spend a ton of time on it, resources on it. Um, so even in those little moments where we're looking at things for ourselves, I think getting to the root of it and thinking about what we can do to actually improve our quality of life, our overall experiences, not those, um, you know, those details around us, those digital fixtures, those physical fixtures around us is really gonna start to change the dynamic. Um, I started that one talk mm -hmm. thinking I was gonna like talk about my sexuality and then I didn't end up talking about it, which is kind of like <laughs> a weird thing to say, but I like, I think one of my best examples is when I worked um, on lighting the White House up in rainbow colors, I wasn't out as a bisexual person. I was actually closeted <laughs> and repressed, but I ended up working over time um, on this project, we didn't even have time for it with all the other things that were moving at that time in the White House to spend significant time um, during the regular work week to be planning for that Supreme Court decision and figuring out how we were going to kind of market and communicate, especially since we didn't know which way it was going to go. Yeah. And there's so many just open ended components of it. But it was the right type of thing to represent like a milestone to show support for the LGBTQI community, to really put our foot down on what our values were as an administration. And so a number of us took time outside of the regular work day and we didn't come up with anything particularly fancy, <laughs> like lighting the White House up in rainbow colors, doing you know animated social graphics that talked to the progress states had made on um, kind of, uh, legalizing uh, kind of gay marriage, same-sex marriage, all of that like was actually not high-tech stuff. But at the end of the day, in the smallest of ways, I was able to contribute to something that ended up making my own life better. <laughs> it ended up totally. also making it easier for me to kind of come out and recognize the fullness of who I am as a, as a person. Um, you know, not everybody's going to have a story as specific as that but those are the kind of harder more nuanced things that i think we should be trying to get to how are we improving the overall lives and experiences of people with the things that we're creating and these do not need to be high technology solutions and um, sometimes they don't have to be the speediest the quickest thing to, to market either it's often just about digging in really deep and sometimes slowing down thinking about the long-term impacts of something negatively and positively. If I took a moment to just recognize the needs of a community or this moment for a community, who will feel heard for the first time? <laughs> um, 
who will feel supported, who will lean in and engage on these important topics and um, where they might not have before. Um, so those are the types of things I get really excited about. I know I'm like spinning a web of all these different pieces. I can't accurately, you know, can't fully unpack on a podcast, but hopefully it gives people a sense of definitely um, the ways this uh, could go. I think as, as you continue to say, it's like the simplest technologies and um, what is making the most impact. I think about like government websites that people are not thinking about. Someone went through the process of designing this, um, tested it and everything. But those are the types of things that are serving the bigger populations. And uh, it might have not taken a lot of technology to light the White House in uh, rainbow colors, but the impact that that did to people individually and culturally is so much greater than I think anyone can can imagine when um, you're in that position. For better, for worse, right? Like we, um, I say like now so many marketers are also like, you know, they're like, well, it's June. And so everything's in <laughs> rainbow colors. And you're like, okay, at like a certain point, <laughs> the, the black's meaning. You're just- Obama did it first. You don't have to do it too, <laughs> just because you're, a, I don't know, a coffee brand. <laughs> I don't know that the soda is better because it's in rainbow colors. Like we do want to have like, you know, support. So it's making sure that there's real, you know, connection and value there. But I would rather have rainbows everywhere than like no rainbows anywhere. So I'm not even mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great totally. point. And then, I mean, like you have companies like Target who got called out for their rainbow capitalism. So they started partnering with uh, like queer designers and creators to make like actually in the community designs. So that yeah. was, you know, that's- To make those investments, to pay people from the, com from the communities that they're lifting up. It's like, don't just lift up up symbolically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, we have real needs. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, when you're talking about how, like, you did this thing and then it, like, you didn't even realize it applied to you then, but then it did. I feel like one thing that everyone doesn't think about often enough for most people is that, you know, disability, that's the one minority that anyone can join at any time. And so many people don't focus on accessible design um, be that the the colors being legible on an e-reader or posting flat images that e-readers can't pick up, not having alt text, all this stuff. So you make an excellent point that like doing the good thing, even if it doesn't apply to you, it might. And it, even if it doesn't, it still helps someone somewhere along the line. And actually this yeah, goes- Never regret making those investments that actually support a broader set of people outside of the communities that you're part of. It's always going to pay off for, yeah. for people at large in some way. I think a lot of the like tech sphere is very focused on being disruptive right now. And you have to ask like, who am I disrupting? And like, is this actually a good thing? But you know, this, this goes pretty well into my next question. Um, so what strategies can designers use to ensure they're creating equitable solutions that meet and reflect the needs of the wide spectrum who live in this country and around the world? Yeah, I, I think a big part of it is kind of getting down and shifting our mental models. So not working from a position of, I can fix it. It's not about, you know, we're facilitators, we're bringing certain skill sets to the table, but we're at our best as designers when we're working in deep collaboration with other practices, skills, and with the broad set of kind of uh, members of a community or user group that are actually going to be impacted by a decision. So I think an important thing is shifting that mental model from I, I made this <laughs> um, power ownership kind of control into, you know, a, a mindset of facilitation, support, bringing in humility and openness to learn and then taking in those principles of kind of co-design, designing um, with and not just for, really working hard to flip those power dynamics um, in every aspect that we can across the design process so that we're not, I've got this project, now I'm just gonna swoop in. <laughs> like you were saying, right? Disrupt your world, because um, now we're ready to solve your problem. Oh, you're not ready, it doesn't matter. We're ready to solve your problem. <laughs> like. You have five minutes to tell us the issues and 
we're going to go in a corner and make some solutions like nothing about that that works um i think at our best we're um we're supporting and we're acting as that supportive layer we're really honest and transparent about the scope that we have and um, the commitment we're making and the level of involvement that we have so that folks can make their own decisions with how much they wanna engage with us. Um, you kind of mentioned the disability community, right? Like the, you know, the, the phrase, obviously it's been around for a lot, a lot longer in the Latin, but it really became known as a calling card for um, the disability rights community. It's like nothing, about us without us, like, you know, really just engaging deeply in this work um, has been so much of what folks have asked for from designers. And I think it's a foundational starting point that can drive much of how we interact, how we charge, who we have subcontract to us, or we're kind of paying to collaborate, the way that we recruit um, to, interviews and whether uh, folks from the community are paid, the way we phrase um, kind of feedback or respond to the types of insights we're getting to communities that can really indicate whether we see their personal experiences and recognize that as expertise or whether we, you know, downplay those and way more highly profession, professional, quote unquote, qualifications over lived experience. Those are the types of things I think um, are really critical. And those aren't like specific tasks. They're not specific flows that anybody has to go through. It's like the, the work to kind of adjust, like I said, those mental models that power everything. Because once you start to adjust those, you know, you. I feel like I'm finding new ways to be like, okay, we need, we can improve. <laughs> this email ask, we can improve, you know, everything throughout the process um, as we go to include communities, think about the folks who are most on the edges, think further ahead about who could be impacted by the work um, and just engage humbly, deeply, collaboratively um, to solve the types of problems that will be kind of impacting folks for, for long times to come. Definitely. And it's like a, I think it's a labor of love um, if and commitment to it as well. It's um, I, whenever people ask me about accessibility, I usually tell them, hey, it's not like a series of checkboxes. There are things you can put to a checkbox, but um, it the work is never complete. Um, I think yeah. my favorite thing was when someone asked me, how much do you charge us to integrate accessibility? And I'm like, it's not like a <laughs> plug-in. It's not like I'm going to... Yeah add a little sheet somewhere. Um, it starts from the beginning and um, there's always room for improvement. So I definitely, um, I like sort of how you addressed it as um, sort of even how you communicate with, with people um, being part of that. Yeah, I mean, certainly like follow the best practices, but a lot of those need to go further, <clears throat> right? Like ADA policies are a solid starting point but we're trying to go beyond that. You know, you could hit those like yeah. double A, triple A, but you know, you could you could make a PDF as accessible as possible. And then there's always like, was the PDF the right format? Like, <laughs> you know, Definitely. for it to be in to, to begin with, or we remediated it, we made it as, you know, as accessible as possible. What, you know, um, so kind of going back to the core, I think it helps me um, and, and kind of my team be able to think on a really regular basis. Um, yeah, in those retros that we have always, like what have we learned? What, we, what could we improve for next time? You know, who did we leave out of the process? The folks that we involved, are we, are we um, asking the right questions, giving enough enough space to be really learning the right things. Cause you're right, it's not a, it's not a checklist um, type, <laughs> type of challenge. <laughs> um, we, could, we could have a hundred folks in the disability community um, test a product that we're launching. But if that testing criteria ask the wrong questions, yeah. um, we're not going to get to the to the heart of the problem. Um, and we're probably going to create a lot more frustration than we're actually solving. So sometimes folks really want to do the right thing, but um, 
you know, and start at too high of a level versus starting really in the center with the values and the core um, and the thinking of the group. So I like to start there and then we're constantly iterating and pushing the envelope on everything that kind of um, comes out from those concentric circles that ripple yeah. um, from the center. Definitely. And now talking a bit about the work you're currently doing, because uh, you mentioned your team. Um, you, I know you've been hard at work after leaving uh, the White House and you also were at auto, uh, Automatic for a period of time, which we love WordPress. Um, and you built Coforma with uh, your business partner, Eduardo. Um, and y'all partner both with private businesses and with government agencies to sort of give that mix of uh, both worlds, like the um, love for public service with less of the red tape, maybe that uh, you encounter in the private sector. So uh, specifically with whenever you're working with uh, government agencies, what has been your experience in improving their services and how open have they been to that change? I guess to back up one step to like Eduardo and I, both work in government. So we know deeply, you know, we talked a little bit about mine, but we know deeply kind of what it can be like mm -hmm. in government and some of the blockers and some of the challenges that uh, different types of civil servants have in trying to make change in those ecosystems. Part of the reason we made Coforma as a business was in part because there were blockers that were going in in the kind of um, administration at the time that weren't allowing us to continue to make change on some things that we had gotten really great connections with that we knew there was a lot of progress that could be made that we're really passionate about um, just given the politics and the mandate coming from the top down. So areas like immigration reform uh, as one example. So part of our kind of working both with folks outside of government and inside of government was in part to make sure that we could continue working on still civic um, issues, even when the government itself was a blocker. Um, and that can be incredibly empowering to some of those civil servants who are embedded and they're like, help me, I'm still trying to make change, but I don't have permission to do certain things and I'm limited right now to say, okay, we're working with this nonprofit and this other private sector company. We're going to help, you know, tackle this area of, uh, you know, understanding um, the, you know, immigration landscape while you're not able to do that research internally we'll at least keep the progress going right on the outside um, so that once you get that approval internally, you've got more to work with. You don't feel like you've just lost ground. You've lost four years or however long it ended up being. And so part of that was intentional uh, for us to be able to see progress um, made and we're able to find some of those opportunities and projects like our immigration policy tracking project where we worked with um, uh, a professor and um, lawyer uh, steeped in uh, the immigration space who had tracked every action taken on immigration by the Trump administration um, so that it could be like, some of that stuff could be rolled back. People could know the timelines for those pieces. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds across different agencies, the justice system within the executive office. And he started with just spreadsheets, but we were able to work with him even while you know, we're kind of, in a, to a degree, like counter to some of what was happening politically. We're able to track a lot of that stuff, help him develop um, a policy. And he's actually, now he got awards for, um, for kind of launching this amazing platform that's being used by the government now. And he's actually working inside federal government again under a different yeah. administration. Um, so there's a lot more, um, you know, collaboration. Sometimes I think it feels like the only way to make civic change is just working with the federal government, but we see it as kind of a real, um, it, we see it as incredibly important, especially given the way that our democracy is structured to see those connections in and outside of the federal, you know, those federal roles specifically. But we like to think that also makes us, a, you know, good partners to those folks within federal agencies who need that outside support. Sometimes they can use our services for external credibility because we can point to things that are happening in the private sector. We can, um, we can um, help them navigate some of the red tape because we've done it directly <laughs> from our time in government, or we found other strategies, other teams that have kind of precedent that they can use to move things forward. 
Um, so our kind of, we tend to take like a hybrid approach when it comes to working with the government to improve services. And there are certainly some groups where like, you're just doing things really bad. <laughs> we won't partner directly with you, but we'll work in other ways to try to keep progress happening. You know, it sounds, co you know, like it's some weird covert actions that we're taking and it's really just civic service stuff, just working around a team that may be dysfunctional for a time or something like that. Um, and then there are other groups where we know the people understand human centered design, they're passionate, they're dedicated, they're experienced, and we'll just directly work with them in partnership or we'll listen to them about the things that they're blocked on and look for those opportunities externally where we can maybe help unblock them. And we found the more creative that we can be as um, business own owners and problem solvers, the more we're able to make change and show a ton of different examples. We've even done, I don't know if any of this means stuff to you, but we've even done like, you know, human centered design training exercises for government um, procurement officers who are in charge of deciding which vendors for a group to choose who are each saying that they do human centered design. They're like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> we're in charge. They all submitted proposals. Like how are we supposed to know who's saying, you know, who's BSing us, who's giving us real information, who's going to do a good job. How do you, how do you measure this stuff? We've done like deep training where we're like, we're not making money off of this training, but you getting this right yeah. <laughs> is like so important for the entire ecosystem. And like, yeah. not just giving some like big vendor who speaks a good game and like, is totally just going to sit on as a nice series. deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think designers going into the space, we have a, a kind of leg up on others because we are able to think so creatively. We're like, yeah, we will help um, an agency come up with a new procurement process or um, help an agency think through, um, you know, ways to give direct awards to communities that might not otherwise feel like they can directly partner with the government because that barrier to contributing is too high. Um, so those types of challenges, I think, are more the, as a business owner now, some of the like creative organizational design, yeah. <laughs> problem solving <laughs> opportunities that I find myself in on a daily basis. And they're really just about overcoming you know, organizational people blockers and finding ways to empower those who are really ready with inside that, that space. I love that. Um, I, I think it really resonates to some of the values that we share at uh, Online Optimism, where we, one of them is to better our communities. And I think it's really important to have people with that sort of love for the people they have around them. Um, because even as you said, you're not charging maybe for an exercise, but if you're bettering the ecosystem, it comes back tenfold. Yeah. Um, well so worth it. I love that. Cool. Well, I think that is all of our questions. Mira, I don't know if you had any final comments. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ashley. I feel like I learned a lot and I really love the direction that this conversation went in. Um, you have, a, I, I love everything you have to say about like the moral goodness that can come with design. Um, so if our listeners wanted to find you or Koforma on social media, where would they go to do that? Yeah, you can find Koforma at Koforma Co. That's C-O-F-O-R-M-A-C-O -O -O, um, across different various social media platforms. Um, and yeah, my name is Ashley Axio. So the first name, you know, Spelled uh, Ashley a little bit differently, but you'll find me in searches. I'm not too worried about it. Actus is a, is a fairly unique last name. I'm not going to spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> Just Google who lit up the White House in rainbow colors. <laughs> um, well, thank you all so much for having me. I, I hope this is um, useful for your audience. And I really want to see more and more folks get involved in this space and this ecosystem. So I'm always very happy to point people in the direction if they're struggling to find a way to get involved totally separate from my business or me specifically. I'm, I'm here to help people navigate and find a way to 
to get into this space. So I appreciate the platform and your thoughtful questions today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic. Thank you.